Hi, check this out. It's a 4K resolution 22 inch monitor. You might be thinking, meh, what's the big deal? They're dime a dozen. People toss those things away in the dumpster these days. Well, what if I told you that this thing cost $18,000 and re was released in the year 2000? That's 19 years ago. Would you be impressed? <laughs> I know I was, and this was the state-of-the-art monitor for nearly a decade. It is one of the most remarkable monitors ever produced. And this is the IBM T221 or 220 series. As I said, $18,000. This is actually the upgraded model, the T221, released a year or so later, and they dropped the price to a bargain $8,000. But you've got to remember, 4K resolution, 3800 by 2400 in the year 2000. Wow. 4K monitors actually haven't been around for that long. The first consumer 4K monitor, I believe, was an Asus monitor in 2013, and it was a 31-inch monitor. This is a 22-inch monitor with full 4K resolution, 204 pixels per inch. Wow. So this monitor, affectionately known as Big Bertha, I believe that was its internal code name at IBM, the famous three letters on the top, was the dominant monitor for practically a decade in terms of resolution, in terms of uh, dots per inch. Absolutely remarkable technology for its day, and it still holds up pretty well today. As you can see, it still works as a standard PC. 4K monitor, and there's some fantastic technology spared no expense inside this thing. As I said, released at $18,000. And I guess you could actually buy this as a consumer back then, but it was not a consumer monitor. It was designed for the high-end professional market. The first prototypes of these monitors actually went to the uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. So all of those, you know, those physics things and all those high-end life sciences stuff that really needed to model things and display stuff in high resolution. This was the only game in town in 2018 grand. Ah, chump change. So thank you very much to the viewer who donated this thing. Uh, and we're going to do a teardown to find out what makes this tick. Because I think there's some no expense spared technology in here. Let's go. Teardown time. Sorry, I turned it on first. Oh. And if we put a microscope up to the screen, you can see the individual pixels there, the picture elements, the red, green, and blue. But you'll notice that there's actually uh, two of each color and they kind of look different and that's because this is what's called a dual domain display and dual domain means that there's uh there's two pixels for each color and they're actually angled differently so this increases the field of view in the display and this display is really excellent field of view and ibm were one of the uh, pioneers in these dual domain uh well in this case it's an ips display everything's ips these days isn't it you hear about it all the time but back then it was a big deal it's a, an in-plane switching dual domain LCD. Brilliant. Pioneering technology for the day. So here it is, and it's actually quite <laughs> large and heavy. It's got a big bezel around it like this. Weighs about 13 kilos or thereabouts. Just got a, a simple button interface, power and brightness and uh, menu. And it does actually tilt like that, which is can tilt all the way down like that, which is actually quite nice, or all the way back. It's thick as, because as we'll see, it's going to have lots of circuitry inside to drive this baby with 2000 uh, era technology. So, or, you know, near on 20 year old technology now. And it does come with a cover plate that goes over that. But uh, this is all just designed to get the cables out the uh, bottom here and come out the back and you can actually clamp them. Whilst it does have standard DVI capable inputs, doesn't have the DVI connectors. It's got these uh, LFH60 connectors, four separate DVI inputs here, plus a uh, Molex power connector. So I'm surprised I couldn't fit the power supply inside, but there you go. It's a big brick. Um, I believe the monitor takes about 130 watts nominal.
And the cable that comes with it is that uh, LFH60 to dual DVI like this. And you can either plug in one, two, or four. And it's got a USB as well, but this you don't have to plug that in. That's for uh, firmware upgrade plus some uh, color management stuff, which I haven't uh, played around with, presumably for, you know, color calibration. And I do believe it came with uh, two video cards as well. Curiously, it doesn't have the uh, DVI on there. It's just got the uh, LFH60. 60 and this is a um, NVIDIA uh, Quadra FX 370 LP there you go <laughs> old school like it's a nothing graphics card these days but I don't know was that hot shot in 2000 the most fascinating thing about this monitor is, as I said, you can either plug in one DVI and it works fine, or you can plug in two DVI, or you can plug in four DVI, I don't believe three works. Um, so <laughs> why? Well, if you plug in one DVI, then it only has a 13 hertz refresh rate. You plug in two, it jumps up to 25. You plug in all four, and it jumps up to 41 hertz refresh rate. And the monitor itself is 41 hertz. And apparently it splits up the screen into 960 by 2400 uh, columns. But of course, you know, it doesn't like skip them if you only plug in one. You still get your full resolution. It's just the update rate that changes. So that's absolutely fascinating. Does anyone know of another monitor that does that? Because uh, presumably uh, you've only got X number of uh, lanes in here and they just didn't, couldn't transfer all the data at the time anyway with the uh, technology they had back in 2000. So you had to use multiple ones to get the bandwidth required to get the full 3840 by 2400 resolution at 41 hertz. <laughs> Incredible. And the demo you saw me just run, I was just using a single DVI in a standard latest GTX uh, 1030 video card. It works and detects just fine, detected the full resolution. And you can see that's actually got primary and secondary written on those. There's a fan in there to uh, keep it cool. It wasn't particularly uh, loud at all. But anyway, let's take this beast apart and have a look. It's going to have no expense spared technology, no thought given to mass production. They just really didn't care. This is not a consumer monitor. They were only going to sell these in low volume. As I said to like research in institutions, government departments and physics researchers, stuff like that, who had a requirement for the high definition screen back then. Remember, you could put on this one 22 inch monitor, you could put four full HD screens at once. I mean, that was just remarkable almost 20 years ago. All the details for those playing along at home. And for all you serial number aficionados. Ah, oh, you can't stand monitors up like that anymore. Beautiful. Two extra sneaky bugger screws. All right, I think she's just gonna lift right up. Or maybe not. I might have to get along that edge. Beautiful. Oh, we're not in like Flynn. Because look at the shielding on this puppy. Whoa, look at, those, look at that mesh grill. Thing of beauty. It's joy forever. Check this out. Absolutely no screws at all holding that in. I just had to take a bit of the uh, tape off <laughs> for the ribbon cable going down to the front connector down there. I think that's just going to lift out all the fans. Yep, might have to disconnect those. And we're in like Flynn. Not a single screw, just the <laughs> six outer Phillips on there. Ah, oh, beautiful. Look at that. Look at those big Altera Apex FPGAs. Wow. Wow, that's really something. Check it out. <laughs> Two huge Altera Apex FPGAs. We'll take a close look at those. This is just your processing board, let alone your driving board, because you can see all the flat flexes coming from the board underneath. You can see how they've probably uh, split these into four uh, columns. As I said, uh, it processes these in 960 by 2400. Our rows are just these buggering off here. So, geez, it's not much in that. Um, yeah. Was it serial over to the rows, really? Or 8-bit, you know, data? Check it out. I see a genuine bodge there. Look at that. They've bodged in a larger resistor onto the smaller pads. They've gunked it down. And there's another bodge up there. But of course, you got to bodges in these sort of things because, as I said, they're not going to respin the board because they don't manufacture these in the millions. They manufacture these in the thousands. So add in a couple of links and bodges anywhere is no problem whatsoever. More bodges up here. Look at that. Ah, oh, thing of beauty. Fantastic. 
They've got some wires running over to the bottom side. That's common, of course, often you might have to connect these to the bottom side and there's a couple of ways you can do that. If you've got like a, like a very simple board with large vias or some other holes, then you can actually put them down the vias, tiny little mod wires down there and get them over to the other side. You can put them or you can solder them onto the vias. But uh, in this case, we've got like a huge multi-layer, um, almost certainly uh, blind and buried uh, vias in there. You have to run the wires over the edge of the board. And, you know, occasionally you might drill through if you know what you're doing. If you've got access to the original files you can see oh yeah i can drill through that point but of course then you can short out internal planes and do all sorts of other stuff yeah nasty got this board flapping around in the breeze and let's flip it down ta-da oh look at that <laughs> look at the huge bodge wires on the bottom huge gorgeous looking ribbon cables going over absolutely fantastic power bodge wires look at that Wow, they just, I, they couldn't get that through on the inner layer. Obviously, the low impedance required through the inner planes, I guess. So they had to wire those straight over that. So it's not actually an afterthought. Um, the, well, it might have been at the PCB stage. They might have been like hoping that they could do it on the PCB. But then they went, Meh, no, sorry, can't do it because we have to add another four layers and use two ounce bloody copper or something like that. So they decided, oh, bugger that. Um, and they integrated the proper pad. So it's not a bodge. It's actually, they designed the board like that. And they even added the silk screen like that to show that the cables go over. So yeah, that's, that's one of the trade-offs when you designing products like this, especially ones that require high power. It is a trade-off because we've got those massive BGAs on the top of this board. Remember that. These are probably 1,000-pin BGAs with tiny little piss ant pads. That are thermally, to actually solder those and get a decent yield on those, then, you know, you can't just go using two-ounce copper willy-nilly to get your, your impedances down on your huge power requirement sections and stuff like that. So it's a real trade-off when you're designing boards like this that are combining a fairly la beefy large amount of power here, like 130 watts in this particular case, and got ridiculously high-end. These would have been bleeding edge at the time, FPGAs, and just the, th you know, it's the assembly requirements that your Kamigatsa are on. And it's not uncommon to have to um, do a trade-off like that. This guy, oh, I give up. <laughs> okay, we'll run some wires. Well, that's the life of a PCB designer. But therein lies an interesting discussion which could go on for hours about uh, whether or not like just the PCB layout designer was responsible for this because you can get PCB layout designers who had, I'm not going to say nothing, but they know like little about the design side of things, but they're very good at board layout and they understand all the rules and things like that. But when you come a gutsa with some sort of, you know, power requirements trade-off, they might often know that, but they won't be privy or look into the design and things like that. It would have to be whoever the design engineer or the team responsible for you know overseeing this would have had to go, look, we're going to have to run some wires over here. We've done the calculations. We're not going to be able to you know get the impedance down to what we need to. There's too much voltage drop on those inner planes and we're going to have soldering problems with the uh, FPGAs. And it, uh, it's all a big team trade-off. So something as simple as what might look like bodge wires can have a lot of engineering reasons and resources and history behind it and everything else. So it would have been interesting to know whether or not they just knew that from the get-go or whether or not they assembled the boards, tried to do it on the copper and went, ugh, nah, failed or our FPGAs couldn't be soldered properly or whatever it was. And then they went, yep, okay, let's add the wires. Hmm. All right, so let's have a look at the board here. And the first thing is, I'm actually quite surprised that there are no extra FPGAs in this thing. It's done with these two big Altera FPGAs, although, of course, there's no uh, surprise for finding you know, the biggest FPGA of the time, the Altera Apex in here. It's actually, when they first came out, they were released in 99. So the 20K400 device, which is what we have in here, this was the very first release of this. It's not the most powerful uh, one. They did actually eventually release uh, extras 
here if we go down the product table here you can see this is the one we got here the 20k 400e it's got over a million system gates 212k of ram although we saw we had extra memory on there as well but they did eventually release uh higher end parts than this and you saw prices there 18650 to 2400 dollars depending on the speed grade so i'm not sure what speed grade but let's just say two grand per fpga so there's four grand just in fpgas there so you can see when they designed these monitors back in 2000 there's there's four thousand dollars just in those two chips there so yeah that's a big deal so you can see where we talk about before about how uh yield on these boards due to say if you use two ounce copper in these because you needed to get the uh, the power distributed across that uh, retains more heat and then fpgas don't flow they, they get trickier to reflow and other parts get trickier to reflow and if you get bad yield on a two thousand dollar fpga well, it could ruin your day, even in these sort of low volumes. So you can see why, uh, but by far the most expensive item in this entire uh, monitor would have been the IPS uh, dual domain display itself, which was absolutely state of the art at the time. So I don't know what the raw cost of that and the yield on that wouldn't have been terrific either. Um, so, and of course they wouldn't have accepted any dead pixels, which was, uh, I think, re still reasonably common um, around that era to accept that sort of stuff. But anyway, these do everything. There's none on the back. There's none on the other board. So there you go. And uh, we've got some, uh, we've got the DVI receivers there and they're just TI panel bus digital receivers. There you go. You can play along with that at home if you want. And there's actually four of those. There's two on the top and two on the bottom. So no surprises there. And they just all flow uh, directly into the um, Apex um, FPGAs. But the interesting thing is, I keep saying FPGAs because, but they're actually not. These are interestingly, they're uh, they're programmable logic devices. Look up here. You have a look at the data sheet. The industry's first programmable logic device. They're a PLD. They actually use a, a slightly different architecture than what uh, your more modern FPGAs do. Although these do have a ton of flexibility and you could actually, they released soft cores for these as well. You could, could get ARM process cores and everything you can throw in these just like FPGAs, but they're actually more suited to more deterministic timing, uh, which might, bastard bloody camera. Stupid bloody auto power off on my Canon camcorder I'm using here when I've got the mains plugged in. Doesn't happen on battery. I'm on battery now. Anyway, um, yeah, they're more deterministic behavior, which for something like this, I can understand like a you know, high end critical timing at the time to uh, do all this sort of stuff. We won't you know, like <laughs> won't talk about the details too much. But yeah, anyway, these were state of the art. FPGAs at the time, even though these were PLD architectures, and they were these released in '99, uh, but then they were followed on with the Stratix arch architecture FPGAs, and then after that, pretty much they just uh, FPGAs for everything. And if you search for the term FPGA in there, you'll see them talk about this, this fast track interconnect. Um, this global routing structure provides predictable performance even in complex designs. In contrast, the segmented routing in FPGAs requires switch matrices to connect a variable number of routing paths, increasing the delay between the logic. That's why I was talking about more predictable and faster timing within the chip. And that may or might not have been valuable in this particular application. But anyway, this was the biggest bad boy on the block back in uh, 2000, a couple of grand each, but even that, like, well, that's not an expensive FPGA. I've used more expensive ones. So these are our panel driver chips down here, and there's uh, more on the uh, bottom as well. So uh, basically flows in here, gets processed by the FPGAs and just spills straight out into the connectors. This is, these vias here go down onto those big flat flex connectors. You can see the big uh, brackets on the back there. So they, it just basically flows yeah, in, through, out, boom, straight to the other board, which then has uh, the LVDS drivers, which then you know, drive the panels. But uh, yeah, that's basically it. So the complexity inside this thing, it, it, I, I expected a fair bit more. So it's interesting. We've got another microchip, a uh, 16C765 in a PLCC socket for the win. And you can see, look, we've got some uh, clock drivers over here. These are uh, zero, Cypress zero delay uh, buffers here. So various clocks. So I'm, I'm guessing that the microchip pick here controls the different clocking and resolution modes and maybe, you know, handles some... 
uh, like mode changes and processing and handles the different as you plug in the different monitors and stuff like that. Um, as I said, the different refresh rates, of course, it doesn't do any of that in real time. It's just instructing the FPGA to do things because these uh, they wouldn't have been running any sort of processor inside these, sorry, PLDs. Yeah, so the external microchip parts are doing that. And we've got some Altera parts up there. They look like some memory. Is that our boot memory? That looks like it. Geez, usually you'd put those like right near the chips. Anyway, what else have we got? Uh, we've got two other microchip parts here. So I'm not sure what all that stuff's doing. Uh, just got some gates down there and your power supplies. Look at those five milliohm resistors there. Ah, oh, big beefy. They're doing some current sensing there. And that's about all she wrote. We've got some diodes running down here. And... That connector's buggering off to the board on the bottom. I don't know why. They've got what looks like some configuration resistors over here and test points. They've got those here on the other side as well over there. So, yeah, anyway, uh, we've got four fan connectors down there. Um, we've only got two fans fitted. There's a couple of things down the bottom. It's about all she wrote. Another fuse. There's fuses everywhere. Fuses coming out the wazoo here and up there for the uh, also for the that goes off to the backlight uh, display, so that'd be mostly power and maybe a control signal as well. But that's about all on top. There's nothing much extra on the bottom side, really, except the uh, interface memory. You can see all the all the memory is actually under here like this. So all this routing and all these uh, ter series termination resistors here on the FPGA. That's common to put series uh, resistors in the data lines just to take the edge off and... Um, that's all going to the external memory, which would be like your frame buffers and everything else holding your display information. But yeah, I'm just generally surprised that they just did everything in there, but I just, it's all they needed. Obviously couldn't do it in one. They had to split it out into two. That's for you flat flex fetish aficionados. And you can just see the bottom side of the board there. They've got all the memory around here. They've got the extra uh, panel drivers, whoop, extra panel drivers down here and over here as well. But that's about all she wrote. There's not much else doing there, really. Um, and, of course, the uh, interface uh, receivers. And what's that up the top? A whole bunch of... Can't really see those. And then on our bottom board here, there is basically uh, nothing on the uh, bottom of this thing, very little. And this basically just distributes. I thought there'd be more processing down in here, but all the display information's already done, it already comes over, all these differential pairs, and they just flow down to these, uh, what's called, it's written on there, mini LVDS chips. And these mini LVDS chips, this is actually a Texas Instruments thing, and here it is, mini LVDS interface uh, specification. And this actually, this monitor was released before the mini LVDS standard was actually uh, announced. And it was a cooperation between TI and IBM at the time. So that would have been one of the first uh, chips that, well, the first chip um, under that uh, collaboration between TI and IBM. So I guess they couldn't. The LVDS drivers at the time just weren't suitable. They weren't fast enough. I, d I don't know what the deal is. But anyway, they teamed up with uh, TI and they developed this new mini LVDS standard. And this was the first chip used. I can't actually find any data on any ready data on that. There's later ones, uh, data available for later versions, but not that particular one. Anyway, so there's four of those. And there's a little um, Altera PLD in there. Um, it's just doing some housekeeping. Not sure what. Anyway, just some glue, jelly bean logic or whatever. And the rest of this is power supply stuff. And as you can see, all those uh, caps up there for the power going to, uh, there's all the bias voltages for the lcds and stuff like that We've got the same thing going on over here as well no biggie because you're going to have all of your high frequency stuff shielded by using shielded ribbons down here and all just your dc bias voltages and stuff just going over a regular joe blogs ribbon so that's all she wrote on the bottom nine megapixels made in japan all the best stuff's made in japan and I just love how these gigantic flex displays all have these custom metal brackets holding them on because these are uh, flex to board inner connects and you can't just have them like vibrating or you know uh, pulling loose because they're a huge number of way on these and really you need a like a very stiff backing plate like the custom metal plate to 
to hold them in place. So, you know, when they're being transported or something like that, because there's a lot of, uh, just a lot of design engineers don't think about actually transporting their products. And there are actually uh, vibration standards for transport, whether it's by road or by air or by rail. And there's uh, various standards where, you know, various vibration modes that you would have had to have tested something like this to. And if you just had the flat flex without these screwed in back in plates, there's X amount of force that's going to keep those uh, those connectors in. And they may or may not have had plastic uh, clips on them, and that may be enough, but maybe they don't. So they decided to add in these, um, you know, a screw in metal plates, and then, then you don't have to worry about it. And check this out. It looks like those flat flexes have, look, this is copper. So this is big copper tape. Probably on the back here, they're entirely shielded all the way over. So, oh yeah, there, yeah, there it is there. You can see the big shield on the, on the back there. So they've actually got that, those, those shields tied into, you can see the ground, the thermal relief going in there. They've got those tied into the PCB. So as well as providing a backing force on there to keep the connectors in, um, it also provides a, a very secure grounding point as well. Brilliant. I mean, like, spared no expense. Really spectacular. Spared no expense. Spared no expense. Spared no, 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 no expense. And yep, there's no plastic uh, retainers on those. So yeah, they would have just fallen straight out when you put it on the truck. So they had to add those plates. And I love the stiffening plate on the back as well. Because that's just, ah, it's beautiful. And I totally forgot to mention the hot snot win. And for you bodge aficionados, there's the back side of the bodge there. I love the capped on tape just holding it down nicely. Beautiful. And another one over there as well. Oh, that's a couple of little, that's, it looks like a couple of little diodes. What is that? Can I zoom in? And these are just LVDS uh, drivers. Look, they come, you can see that they come straight from the connectors here. So, you know, really, um, not doing much at all, just uh, driving the ribbon cable, as I said, down to then what uh, well, a lot of people might call like a T-con uh, board or whatnot. So that goes to your, uh, your column drivers down there. That one's got a bit of dust in it, but apart from that, it's pretty clean. But yeah, there's not much doing on there at all. Your high-speed stuff, of course, is going on these ribbon cables here, these are all your uh, LVDS, uh, you see they all go as uh, pairs in there, so they're all buggering off and you can tell because they're fully shielded cables as well, high speed stuff. And if I get a torch right along the top there, trust me, we ain't missing much, there's no real circuitry on there, just a bunch of caps, there's nothing under here between the big thick uh, aluminium frame, so... Really, um, that's basically just an interface, um, go interface board going over to your, then going into your larger flat flex or multiple flat flexes then, which would then go into your I, uh, IPS LCD panel in there. So uh, yeah, I, like, trust me, we're not missing anything by not uh, taking all that apart and having a look in there really. And it looks to be the uh, same for the row driver boards over here as well. And I did, like I don't want this to be as destructive teardown because this is a gorgeous monitor. And uh, really, I've looked at uh, those sort of stuff before. You can see uh, LCD uh, TV uh, teardowns where I've actually gone right down and looked at the interfaces, uh, the the chip on flex. Uh, drivers on there for all the columns and rows and things like that. So. I won't do it here because it's still all the same. But yeah, this is like, well, this is a state-of-the-art LCD. Uh, I don't know who, who actually made the actual LCD display. I don't actually know. So um, yeah, but it seems to be a lot of work to rip the whole thing apart and get in there. So I might just leave it. But if anyone knows, um, but leave it in the comments. But this would have been a state-of-the-art IPS uh, LCD panel full 4k back in the day uh it would have cost an absolute fortune it's probably you know thousands of dollars uh, just manufacturing cost in the lcd panel alone and just check out the backlight driver board there isn't that gorgeous i love that they got this big plastic shield over it that's terrific that's to stop people poking in there and none of that lead backlighting rubbish either this is uh ccfl all the way
So thank you very much to Brian Venvenu for donating this for uh, Teardown. Absolutely fantastic. So if you like this video, please give it a big thumbs up. And as always, you can discuss down below in the comments or over on the EEV blog forum. And hope you found that interesting. And if you know any more details about this uh, monitor or you worked on the design team or you know someone who did, please let us know. It's just a gorgeous example of state-of-the-art engineering at the time, not worrying about production cost or any of that rubbish. It, it sold what it sold for, basically. Um, there was absolutely no thought given to getting the cost down on this thing. And it's just it's built like a tank, and it's just gorgeous. Spared no expense. I love this kind of engineering. It's fantastic. Anyway, hope you enjoyed it. Catch you next time.